Hey, welcome to Pound of Spirituality. Uh, I'm Phil Farber, and uh, I'm the author of a few books, uh, including Brain Magic and High Magic, my most recent one. And uh, the subject of High Magic is a guide to cannabis and ritual and mysticism. And that's the subject of uh, our little talk here today. Uh, it's actually kind of a daunting uh, task to, to fit this information. It was a daunting task to fit it into a book uh, because there's just so much information. And uh, the more I researched the topic of cannabis spirituality, uh, the deeper I got in. I, I fell down the rabbit hole and, uh, and kept going. Uh, right now, I mean, we're seeing all over the world, but it, particularly here in the United States, we're seeing states legalizing cannabis for various reasons. For uh, most of the states now have, uh, with the exception of only a few, have uh, some form of medical marijuana. <clears throat> uh, and I think we have about 13 states now that have uh, legalized recreational use. Uh, what we don't really talk about all that much uh, is the idea of cannabis spirituality. And for many of us, and actually for tens of thousands of years, uh, cannabis spirituality was one of the foremost uh, uses of this plant. Uh, we'll get into that uh, in just a minute. The, um, uh, the cannabis plant is, it's an absolutely fascinating plant. Uh, it's very unique in that it's one of the only ethnobotanicals, one of the only plants used by man that provides pretty much all of the things that you need to build a civilization. Uh, you can get fiber and cloth and fuel and food and medicines of all different kinds and uh, structural materials and biomass and all kinds of different things uh, from cannabis. Uh, it's also a great crop to plant to clean soil and to renew soil for other crops. Uh, and so going way back, the, the first people who were, uh, and we're talking Paleolithic times now, uh, the first people to really encounter cannabis were probably looking for food. And they were finding that the seeds uh, in the cannabis plant were not only edible, but nutritious and pretty tasty actually. And uh, nowadays you can go into a health food store, right, and buy cannabis seed powder or cannabis seed uh, hemp seed. And, <clears throat> uh, but back then they undoubtedly had to like pull apart the buds of the plant and pick the seeds in. In the process of doing that, uh, they probably got some of that sticky stuff on their fingers that, was, that the, uh, the buds are covered with, uh, the cannabis resin. And of course, cannabis resin smells wonderful, tastes pretty good. Uh, so they were probably uh, you know, smelling it, tasting it, uh, doing whatever they could, and probably learned pretty quickly that there were some other properties to this plant other than just food. Now, uh, so this goes way back and uh, before recorded history. Our earliest recorded mentions <coughs> of cannabis are pretty ancient as well. Uh, the, the first written mention uh, comes from the Emperor Shen Nang, who was a legendary figure in China who wrote the first pharmacopoeia, the first book of, uh, of medicines and herbs. And uh, this is uh, the year 2737 BC, okay, before the birth of Christ, uh, almost 3,000 years. And uh, Emperor Shen Nang he had had a special place for the hemp plant for cannabis and uh he he listed a variety of different medicinal uses for it including gastrointestinal disorders and uh, other things <clears throat> and uh but he also suggested that not only was cannabis uh useful as a longevity treatment right? this is his elixir of immortality with some other herbs uh, but also that it had a spiritual use, that people who use cannabis would be more able to attain the Tao, right? to, to become one with their own spiritual nature, or however you want to 
define the DAO. And defining the DAO, not really a good thing, but uh, uh, so our, our first written use uh, uh, record of cannabis is actually also one about spiritual use. And uh, that continued on. Now, humans probably co-evolved with this plant uh, you know, for a, a very long time. Uh, there's some debate over where the plant originated uh, with some, uh, some really good evidence that it originated in Tibet. Uh, also, some evidence that in Central Asia, probably it was in all these places uh, very early on prior to human history. And uh, we find that uh, the, the peoples in, the, in that area uh, began to use it for a, a lot of different things. In ancient China, we have, uh, uh, and some other areas, we have what was known as the, the, the cord people. And they were called that because we find ancient pottery that has the impression of a hemp cord pressed into it. Now that was probably uh, a marker showing what was in the container, right? There was hemp in the container. Uh, and we also have also, uh, I mean, dating from that period, we, there's fossil remains, uh, not fossil remains, but archeological uh, remains uh, that we found of old shamans and so on. There's one that's something like thousands of years, like 5,000 years old, where they found a shaman who actually uh, had two pounds of ganja with him, uh, which was actually still in good enough condition that uh, the researchers could tell that it was uh, medicinal and you know psychoactive, uh, rather than necessarily something that the, the shaman was using to make his his clothes out of. Um, and uh, so uh, the uh, the current idea is that is that the human race really grew up with this point. And uh, it's at the root of so many of our traditions, of our, our spiritual traditions and uh, actually our cultural traditions. Um, the, there's a, a couple of ethnobotanists. Ethnobotanists are people who study the human use of plants. Uh, Mark Merlin and Robert Connell Clark, who have proposed the idea that uh, back in Paleolithic times, when humans discovered the use of cannabis fibers, of so hemp fibers, uh, for use in rope and clothing and so on. Uh, they were actually, uh, okay, again, you, these were these people who were picking the seeds out and, and uh, uh, licking the hash off their fingers and so on. Uh, the uh, uh, Merlin and Clark uh, proposed the idea that not only did the cannabis plant provide the fibers that could be used in vegan, but it also provided the cognitive leap, right? It, it enabled people to think in different categories because of the psychoactive quality and to make the cognitive leap that weaving and rope and things like that were possible, that they could actually take these fibers and do that. So, not, so on one hand, not only did it provide the raw materials for fiber, right? For uh, weaving, for rope, so on, but also the, the cognitive ability to conceive of such things, uh, which is interesting. And now there's a number of, uh, let's see, Carl Sagan uh, proposed that, that uh, cannabis was probably the first cultivated crop, uh, which makes a lot of sense. Again, it's one that if you're, you're, you're trying to build a civilization, right, you've got fiber and medicine and fuel and food and everything else right, in, in one crop. Uh, Albert Hoffman, the, the famous uh, pharmacologist who's most famous for discovering uh, LSD, uh, uh, also proposed uh, the idea that cannabis was at the, the, the very origin of many of our spiritual traditions, that things like meditation and yoga were actually uh, created in a sense to recreate or, or to uh, draw people into those states that they experienced when they were using cannabis. And uh, from there, let's see, from ancient times, let's, let's do a, a little quick historical survey. Uh, the, uh, I, I mean, this could, could actually, <laughs> I could spend hours uh, talking about the history of it. And in fact, there's historians who, uh, who have written huge volumes of it. I'm going to show you one. Uh, uh, the historian Chris Bennett, 
I uh, wrote this this amazing poem, Lieber 420, which is really quite a thick book uh, on the, the historical uh, spiritual use of cannabis. Uh, uh, it was a very useful uh, research book uh, in, in uh, uh, creating high magic. Uh, anyway, uh, going way back, we have uh, a, a group of people who were coming out of uh, the Middle East and into Central Asia, uh, uh, the Indo-Europeans, uh, otherwise known as the Aryans. And uh, they were notable because uh, they were one of the first people to have to tame horses and to have wheels. So wheeled vehicles being pulled by horses allowed them to be very nomadic and uh, mobile and to travel and spread their stuff a little bit more. Now, at the, the center of their culture was a sacrament called Soma. And uh, Soma, uh, actually we have two records of this in as, as the, the Soma sacrament passed into Central Asia and up into India, it became the name Soma. It, uh, as it went into the Middle East and so on, it became Homa, Haoma. And uh, uh, essentially the same thing, the same kind of sacrament. Uh, the, uh, the Soma sacrament, for many years, there was a lot of debate over what it was. Uh, there was a, an ethnobotanist, uh, a mycologist named uh, R. Gordon Wasson, uh, who in the 1960s, uh, Wasson's most notable uh, because he's the guy who first brought to modern attention uh, the use of psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, and he was, he studied mushrooms, he didn't study cannabis. Uh, so he proposed that the Soma sacrament was a mushroom, Amanita muscaria, uh, and the fly agaric mushroom, the, the one that you see in, uh, you know, uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, that big red mushroom with the white spots on it. And, uh, you know, fairies dance around and gnomes sit on and things like that. Uh, anyway, um, so for many years that was considered the bottom line, that Soma was, was a mushroom. But uh, more recently, uh, after Boston had passed from the world, uh, there were some archaeological digs in Central Asia and so on, where they found Soma and Homa factories or temples, whatever you want to call them, places where they made the, the, the sacrament. And of course, what they found uh, was cannabis. Uh, they found containers that had residue of cannabis in it. Uh, in many of them mixed with other things, with uh, opium and with, maybe with mushrooms and, and the ephedra herb, which is a stimulant. Uh, but cannabis is pretty much the basis of, of all of that. Now, the Soma sacrament uh, passed on from the, uh, the Aryans, from the Indo-Europeans, to uh, people called the Scythians. And the Scythians were even more nomadic, <laughs> uh, and they were amazing horsemen. If you think of uh, in uh, the Lord of the Rings, the, the riders of Rohan, they were kind of Scythians. Uh, and so they, they loved their horses, and they loved traveling, and their whole culture was pretty much uh, centered around the use of cannabis. And so the Scythians, uh, wherever they traveled, and they conquered a larger territory of the planet Earth probably than any uh, any civilization has since then. They, they came up, uh, they came out of Central Asia and across the steppes and uh, conquered a big part of Europe and going to the, to the British Isles and to India and the other direction uh, and down into the Middle East and Africa and so on. And uh, they brought with them the sacrament, the, the Soma sacrament. They, uh, but the, the Scythians had a little bit more variety. The Soma sacrament was a beverage, uh, typically
Okay, I think I'm back. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm, uh, I'm in upstate New York here, and uh, uh, I'm I'm up on top of a mountain. I'm kind of in the boonies and the uh, uh, the archaic telephone lines that come up the, the hill here uh, probably date back to Alexander Graham Bell, who spun them up here himself. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, occasional problems with the, <laughs> uh, with the uh, internet here. Uh, so anyway, I was talking about the Scythians uh, and, and the Soma Sacrament and how the Scythians were able to have these big vaporizers that they would put in tents. And uh, let's see. Okay, are you, are, is, is maybe someone from Llewellyn can tell me, are you hearing me okay? Hmm. Let's see. I'm gonna okay. Audio. Uh, let me see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try one other thing with the router here, and uh, okay, I'm gonna try one other thing with the router, and if it doesn't work, we'll just go back to the audio here. Let's see. All right. Good now. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Hopefully you're hearing me and seeing me now. And uh, yes, excellent. Okay. So uh, anyway, uh, the Scythians, uh, among other things, they brought the Soma Sacrament uh, into India. Uh, and they also brought some of their gods with them. Uh, Indra, and uh, Soma became the, the moon plant of Indra and uh, uh, sacred to Indra. Uh, over the years, the, the, the favored gods changed and uh, Shiva became the more favored god in, in there and the sacrament became one of Shiva's. The, uh, one of the origin myths uh, that we find in the Vedas uh, involves Shiva who, uh, the, at the, the beginning of time, the gods were creating their, the nectar of the gods, Amrita. And they had to stir it and churn it. It was a milky substance, right? That they had to stir and churn. And what were they doing there? And uh, the, uh, uh, somehow it got contaminated. It got poisoned or something. So Shiva and a snake, uh, the, the snake drew off the poison and uh, Shiva was, was churning it up. And as they were doing this, some drops fell to the earth. And wherever the drops fell, a cannabis plant grew. And so Shiva gave the cannabis plants to the human race, the humans, uh, to bring them joy and long life uh, and the knowledge of yoga. And Shiva, of course, is the lord of yoga. And he taught just from the beginning that yoga and cannabis were, <laughs> they went together very well. Uh, and uh, that's sort of coming back now. We're starting to see uh, 420 yoga classes and things like that. Uh, and to this day, the, the Shiva sadhus in India and elsewhere uh, still consume lots of cannabis. They smoke a chillum or they drink uh, the bong, which is much like the Soma Sacrament, uh, a milk solution of cannabis. Uh, and they practice yoga. Now, the... Uh, uh, let's see, let's let's move this up to modern times now. We're, we, we are starting to see this coming back with 420 yoga classes. Uh, I saw that, uh, I haven't read it yet, but I saw that Llewellyn has another cannabis book out, uh, Wake, Bake, and Meditate, which looked very interesting. Uh, and uh, uh, people are beginning to rediscover this. Um, now, uh, my, the, the beginnings of my book uh, of High Magic started about 20 years ago uh, when I was at the Starwood Festival, which at that time was in uh, upstate New York or western New York. And uh, uh, at that, that year, one of the speakers was Stephen Gaskin, uh, the founder of the farm community and one of the, the, the prototypical hippies, I guess, uh, uh, but a very, a very wise fellow. And uh, uh, he was giving a, uh, he had just come out with his book called Cannabis Spirituality. And he gave a presentation on it, which was um, more or less, he, he was kind of, uh, he comes from a Buddhist background and so on. 
And uh, so it's more in the light of Eastern philosophy. So I was thinking, well, a lot of the people at these pagan events are more into Western esoteric uh, tradition uh, and paganism and witchcraft and things like that. So I figured maybe that the following year I would present uh, on, on that level, right? Uh, from that point of view. And I, I went and I talked to Stephen Gaskin about it and uh, we, we shared some ideas. And uh, next year I came back and uh, I presented uh, uh, a workshop called Magic for Potheads, uh, which got a huge crowd and it was really a lot of fun. Um, now, uh, just to kind of get through this quickly, the uh, some of the uh, uh, the things that, that make cannabis really useful for uh, meditation and magical practice. Uh, one thing is that it, it has an interesting effect on the short-term memory. It kind of disrupts your short-term memory, which leaves you very much in the moment of now, right? You're, you're really in the present. So in terms of meditating, it puts you in that position where your mind doesn't really go off in these different directions. Um, the other part of this is that uh, the, the human brain usually has two main network functions that it, it goes to. One is uh, the attention network or executive function, uh, which allows you to do problem solving and focus attention and something like that. And the other is what's called the default network, which is all about imagination and uh, associations and uh, things like that. And a lot of what we do in magic combines both of these. Right? You have to have focused attention to understand the rituals and so on. And then you have to be able to have this use of imagination to appreciate the symbols and to get uh, visions and things like that, right? Uh, normally, these two networks are mutually exclusive. When you're having focused attention, you're not imagining and daydreaming and things like that. Uh, and vice versa, when you're daydreaming and imagining things, uh, your focused attention is shut down. The cannabis allows you to, to have some functions of both of those at the same time, which is kind of a unique state and, uh, and allows you to be able to, to focus on your ritual work uh, and also to appreciate these, these different kinds of associations. Now, what's interesting about the associations uh, is that you have suddenly the way that your mind works and associates and finds different meaning for things becomes more apparent. Uh, it, in fact, every perception that you have when you're high kind of spins off a range of associations. And you can kind of, uh, sometimes it's a little bewildering, right? There's so many of them all at once, but they seem like swirly things and so on. And uh, your brain kind of steps it down a little bit. It tones it down because it's just a little, maybe too much to understand all at once. So your brain gives it sort of symbolic representations uh, in a sense, you get feelings and, uh, and senses about things and so on. So uh, the, um, all right, I guess we are, uh, we're, we're coming up with some uh, uh, question and answer uh, time here. Uh, yeah, sure, let's open up the questions. And uh, uh, like I said, this is such a huge topic and the, uh, uh, the science right now and the history and so on, it's all coming together. I mean, finally we can all share this material uh, as things get legalized. So, I can really only, you know, just like a little, give you a little bit here. So uh, go ahead, ask some questions, and uh, uh, let's see uh, what else you can get in here. Questions? Who's got a question? Um, let's see. I'll, I'll I'll keep talking until I see a question on the screen. The uh, uh, an interesting thing about cannabis is that uh, there's a lot of different active ingredients in it, right? Because we know that there's over 100, now 113 at this point, and they keep finding new ones of, of cannabinoid chemicals, the ones that are specific to cannabis. Uh, and cannabis also contains the um, uh, terpenes and uh, flavonoids and things like that that we find in most other herbs. And the, uh, uh, the, we, we, we understand cannabis as uh, what's called the entourage effect, that it's not necessarily THC alone that does, does the thing, or CBD alone. It's the combination of all of them. And even just uh, the THC-CBD balance 
Uh, you go you go to your local store now. Every my supermarket carries CBD products, um, but the CBD alone isn't necessarily as effective as the combination. Right? And people who who use it for medical purposes know that there's one to one ratios and so on that are much better. So um, let's see. Uh, are, are there any questions? Anybody? <laughs> I'm not. Oh, there we go. Uh, folks, new to the use of cannabis uh, as relates to spirituality. Uh, let's see. One of the main things I would say is learn your meditation or your magic separately from the cannabis, right? Uh, and, and understand your responses to cannabis separately. So uh, you want to you understand them and then combine them, right? So know your magic first. Uh, uh, sometimes, uh, okay, let's see. Uh, recommend. Uh, Raven asks, uh, uh, do you have recommendations for how to respond to people who are against or put down using cannabis during magic or ritual? Well, uh, one response is to recite the history. And frankly, if you, <laughs> you can hit them over the head with a book like this, right? Uh, there, there's, there's so much of it. And, and it goes back and pretty much uh, up until... Uh, we started this, you know, drugs are bad and K thing uh, in, in the 1930s in the United States. Everybody used cannabis. You, you bought it in the drugstore and you gave it to your children for, for their aches and pains. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, and magicians throughout history and, and uh, meditators and so on have used cannabis. And, and it's all really well documented, especially if you go and you look at some of that. Uh, let's see. How would you recommend someone incorporate cannabis into their daily practice? Uh, one way, uh, again, know your practice, know the cannabis first, uh, and then combine them. Uh, sometimes just a few puffs is good. Uh, if if you're gonna, if you're a regular meditator, get a couple puffs, right? Have take take a couple little puffs, then do your meditation. See what's different. Keep, keep good records of it. Write it down. Okay, uh, Brian asks, uh, which variety do you prefer for use spiritually? I, I'm a sativa guy. I, I like the uh, the headier stuff, uh, but everybody uh, everybody's a little bit different, and you got to kind of kind of pick. Uh, uh, Janice asks uh, about the difference between indica and sativa. Um, the The current genetic research suggests that it's all it's all indica. It's all cannabis indica. All the psychoactive strains. And that the true sativa plants are the fiber hemp plants. However, we, we talk about the sativa and indica like we talk about varietals and wine, right? So uh, the sativa stuff is generally the higher THC, lower CBD, um, uh, and the uh, the indica gen generally has more CBD. And the, the terpene myrcene makes a big difference in, in terms of what we call the indica stuff. It's more relaxing, a little bit more of a body high. Uh, so, uh, uh, let's see, Phyllis asked which is best for, uh, for meditation, indica, sativa, or hybrid. Uh, personally, I like the sativas. Uh, the hybrids are, are often very nice. Uh, indica could be uh, very relaxing, uh, so it might work nicely in meditation. Depends what your goals are. Uh, everybody needs to try it themselves and try a few different strains and uh, see what works for them. Uh, Kathleen asked, could you talk about cannabis use for chronic illness? Well, uh, I'm one of those medical users. I have Crohn's disease, which I've had since I was a teenager. Um, fortunately for me, I was a big pothead when I was in high school and uh, and college, and I smoked daily. And my Crohn's disease went into remission for over 20 years. And I go to doctors now. It started coming back as I got older. And I go to doctors now, and they go, really, Crohn's disease? You should have had five surgeries by now. Uh, and then I explain, and I go, oh, okay. Uh, and I've had, and more recently, I've had doctors say, "Hey, you should smoke more of that." <laughs> I go, "Really?" <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Uh, Severus asks about uh, tolerance, uh, and yes, uh, uh, you you build the top. The more you smoke, uh, the more tolerance you have. Uh, so uh, it's often useful to uh, uh, take breaks here and there. Uh, if you're a daily user, you take a break for a week or two. Uh, even just a few days will, will reset some of your receptors and so on. Uh, so, um, okay, I think that's it. Um, and uh, I'm really happy that everybody came. Uh, I'm sorry I talked a little faster at the end because it's a lot 
to get in here. Uh, someone, so, uh, Candace asks, uh, uh, which would you recommend in oil or actual weed? I, I like actual weed, but oil, some oils are very good too. Uh, okay. Um, check out the book, uh, High Magic. And uh, I also, uh, I'm also a novelist. Uh, I did a cannabis novel called Legendary Blue Smoke, uh, which, is, which is fun and has some magic stuff in it too. So uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for listening to me uh, for a little while here. And uh, go have some fun. <laughs>